Hello, everyone. A few days ago, I penned an irritated tweet in response to one of the latest happenings on the increasingly heated culture war front. In response to the decision of an actress, actor named Ellen Elliot Page, I am employing this awkward and impossible naming style because it is now apparently mandatory and am probably doing it wrong nonetheless, as you're doing it wrong is the whole point of what is being made mandatory. But also, I'm trying to make a point. I've essentially been banned from Twitter as a consequence. I say banned, although technically I have been. That cut off early, sadly. I think uh, I think when um, Jake uh, spliced together the video, which is a shame because what we're missing is the most important part. Because the it's next just so sentence, fucking easy to say he him though. I mean, no, I it's, suppose it's, 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 it's fucking nothing. It's it's the like you you literally just say one thing instead of the other thing. It's the you know it, it's what Peterson does a hundred times a day. You know he he refers to to you know. He refers to uh, to male persons as as he and him. He just he does not hard. He just doesn't yeah. want to. Also, you know, he him as and in a higher power as in himself. You know, ultimately. So, nope. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's true too, right? That uh, that yeah, that uh, that there's definitely if if the only thing that pronouns could ever be used for is biological sex, then um, if you believe that God is immaterial, uh, then uh, then you you really shouldn't you really should refuse to uh, to use gender pronouns. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting theological point, but that'd be a lot more sophisticated than what I'm guessing we're going to dive into tonight. So, yeah. Uh, so the part where the video cut off, sadly, is is just before the most amazing part, which is that he says technically he wasn't banned because uh, he was suspended, and they he can be unsuspended whenever he deletes the offended tweet. But I would rather die, he says, than delete the tweet. Which I've got to say, I said this on the post game on Monday night's episode. I have. You know, I, I've written some tweets I'm proud of. How I've written some bangers that have like gotten like ten thousand likes or whatever. That's like, man, that was a good tweet. Uh, I don't think I would die for any of them. No, I can't say so. But hey, listen, if he were to delete it and calm down, then he would miss an opportunity to sit there and dress like a fucking Bond villain and pontificate in front of the world. And you got to have that, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we started with that. Oh, and uh, at the end of that video is. Uh, uh, was it listen up woke moralists? But definitely the last few words are oh, was we'll it up see yours who, woke moralists. Up, yeah. up yours woke moralists. We'll see who cancels who. That's the that's the end. That's that's where it actually starts to sound sort of bond villainy, which is also bizarre because you sit there and you're like, so your whole point is that we need to advocate for free speech, and now you're just <laughs> trading blows and saying I'm going to do unto you what you do unto me. It's like oh, that's a very Christian and very ethical point to take, right? What yeah, maybe that's thing. maybe he's, he's in one of his Nietzsche moods, not one of his Christian moods, but um, but yeah, no, it's weird, right? Because it's it's like, yeah. um, well, hell, I mean, if it's all just sort of you know exercise of power and we're all just canceling each other, then like, why why waste any time fretting about it? I and mean, they let just just get to the get to the smited of your enemies already. Um, yeah, it, it's a like. We were talking about this before we went live that, you know, we've both been, um, you know, we've both been sort of tracking Peterson for a very long time. Too long. Uh, too long, yes. Uh, we, um, uh, we both, you know, we both wrote uh, contributions. Uh, yours is a much larger portion of the book than mine uh, to a uh, book called uh, Myth and Mayhem, a leftist critique of Jordan Peterson. Even before that, you know, I, I mean, I did. I went to this conference on Peterson, two thousand and eighteen, uh, and uh, you know, we've both we've both written other things uh, about him. But we were saying before we went live that it seems like he's got an even stranger, like literally in the last few weeks. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was starting to get a little bit over this whole thing uh, when I read his last book uh, at the recommendation of actually a bunch of editors, you know, the um, Beyond Order 12 Rules More. Because reading it, I kind of had the feeling that you get when you watch like Terminator Genesis or something like that. You're <laughs> like, oh, here we go again. You know, the people wanted it. And here's a sequel, just more or less the same, but somehow less invigorating and less interesting. 
you know, and it's the same old tired stuff. La da 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 da. Clean your room. Yeah yeah da. You know, transcendent morals. Yeah da da. Nietzsche, Dostoevsky has predicted the Russian Revolution, and I was like, uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, and I more or less figured that he was going to go on parroting the same things over and over again, which was kind of disappointing because when I first pitched the idea for that book, I was hoping he would be a more invigorating and stimulating uh, kind of conservative yeah. intellectual. Uh, but now he just seems to have completely gone downhill to the point where he's not even going to try to be a conservative intellectual anymore, at least of any substance. He's just going to go the whole Ben Shapiro route of well, yeah, he's any kind of geo Sorry, He's literally joined the Daily Wire, right? Well, exactly, right? He's just going to sit there and parrot the most generic right-wing talking points uh, in his particular way, let's just put it that, that way, uh, without any kind of substance or innovations being added. And it's kind of boring after a little while. Yeah, it's it's a weird thing, too, because it, it seems like, as far as I can tell, uh, back in what, 2018, maybe even 2017, I think 2018, when... Um, Barry Weiss did the original intellectual dark web article in the New York Times that popularized that phrase. I think it was coined by Eric Weinstein. Um, it seemed like the whole point, right? Like, you know, I mean, like, I mean, I guess they would say the point is to, you know, defend, I don't know, you know free speech and liberal discourse and science, et cetera. But there are plenty of people who like all those things, you know, who are very different from them, right? So, the whole point is I would see it of the branded exercise at that point seemed to be like, this is a high, they, this is a group of sort of conservative you know, thinkers. Uh, yeah. Conservative ish kinds of, uh, kinds of, um, of writers who uh, were, you know, who are going to, you know, defend certain kinds of traditionalist ideas and traditional hierarchies, but are not, um, but are going to do it in a way that's like sort of very self-consciously detached from the branding of like mainstream American, at least uh, conservatism that, uh, that like even Ben Shapiro, who, who was always kind of the odd man out anyway, right. You know, he, he never quite seemed like he belonged, but even yeah. Ben Shapiro was, um, uh, back then a never trumper uh and uh he's you know he's like all of them right you know like you know like all but like three never trumpers at like with jobs at the new york times and stuff he's uh uh you know he's changed his tune a little bit but they have a um, yeah, I'm kidding. but um but even even shapiro's never trumper and you know, Sam Harris, you know, you, you were like, sort of, you were, you were like, there was never any question that he was going to vote for Biden. Right. You know, that was, uh, and, um, and, you know, like the Weinsteins, like part of the, uh, you know, like they made this big point about how in 2016 they voted for Bernie. You sort of, I, I always thought it was like, okay, they're obviously not going to in 2020. And I was correct, you know, but like, whatever, you know, that was like, Again, it was all sort of detached from at least mainstream partisan conservatism in the in the U.S., uh, and that was always kind of the point that it was like not quite that, but like non coincidentally, conservatives would be really into it, and it seems like uh, that balancing act sort of fell apart. That uh, that like you know Harris made a big deal about turning you know turning in his you know imaginary membership card in the IDW basically over COVID and, and election conspiracy theories. And, uh, you know, Shapiro just completely returned to the fold. And now it seems like uh, Peterson, like, has gone from being, like, maybe, a, you know, sort of, like, ambiguously kind of a conservative to, to just, like, just being a right-wing pundit, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, if you watch his original Kathy Newman interview uh, back in 2018, you know, he was smart, articulate, and he more or less espoused fairly generic center-right liberal positions. Uh, oh. And what made him interesting to me uh, wasn't necessarily the content of his politics so much as the theoretical basis on which he oh. got there. Because uh, I read Maps of Meaning, and there are some very interesting things in that book. Uh, it's definitely a little bit eccentric and kind of wacky in points, and God, do you already see that he's got a big ego, right? Uh, you know, it opens with a quote from the Bible, you know, I will reveal things that have yes, thus far been this. hidden from, you know, the foundations <laughs> of the earth. And it's like, okay, jo calm down, you know, like, <laughs> take a step back here, right? Uh, 
but you know, it was an interesting intellectual project and I'm not sad that I read it because I got a few yeah. things from it here and there. Uh, so it was the way that he got there that was interesting, right? Um, now, uh, a lot of that kind of intellectual substance seems to have more or less be gone. Uh, he's just sitting there talking about how people like Alexander Dugan are real philosophers as opposed to these postmodern neo-Marxists, which is a bizarre thing to say about a guy who actually is a happy postmodern conservative, right? Yeah, and and, and like like yeah, Dugan will just say very explicitly, um, you know, like you know, because like usually, you know, because because you've been using for years this phrase, you know, postmodern conservatives, and like a lot of times I feel like okay, I can kind of see what Matt means by that, you know, whatever. But like, I um, first time I saw saw Dugan, you know, like speak, I was I was like shocked because it's like no, no no that is like just like. That is some very explicit postmodernism, right? I mean, he's 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 giving this like very um, like just unambiguously relativistic kind of kind of argument for um, you know for like you know great you know like like you know pan Slavic you know blood and soil nationalists you know I guess he would resist the word fascism, but for hilarious reasons that he thinks that it's. Uh, because he thinks that fascism is too much of a product of the modern world, he's like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm too reactionary for that. You know, I'm, I mean, I, I, I reject the entire modern world, fascism included. But like, whatever you want to call his goals, right? You know, he's he's arguing for them in this sort of like, well, hey, don't impose your, you know, these like, you know, Anglo-American values on me. We've got our own Russian values. Oh, absolutely, and. Again, self-consciously postmodern, right? I mean, he has a lot yeah. of nice things to say about Foucault and Derrida yeah. <laughs> uh, and Deleuze, especially. Uh, and you kind of sit there and you're like, if this is the company that you're starting to keep at this point, it's very hard to take you seriously intellectually, um, especially because I really doubt that he's ever even read Dugan uh, or knows very much about Dugan. He probably just heard something you say like, oh, Dugan, he's standing up for judeo-christian values uh over and against the kind of decadent woke culture that's emerging in russia and i was like okay there's my guy right yeah. uh, my, 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 to... my sense of dugan is that he would reject the uh, judeo prefix oh yeah probably right uh and so we'll watch this today uh maybe there'll be something new uh but i have to say that along with some other people uh as somebody who's Opposed him for a long time, but once upon a time thought he was an interesting intellectual. Uh, I'm still opposed to what he said, but I just don't think that there's anything that's really all that interesting left. Uh, you just have what amounts now to Ben Shapiro with a bigger thesaurus uh, mouthing off more regularly uh, and even more goofily is really the only way to describe it. Yeah. Um... I mean, what was his latest one? I watched... About half an hour of the documentary was talking about um, the war in the Ukraine being a civil war. And near the end where he sits there and he's just like, I also think that the COVID restrictions had something to do with this. <laughs> think back to when we could meet face to face. People could actually meet with Putin. But now what we're doing is everybody has to meet from <laughs> That's the problem that like you know, nobody could have, you know, nobody could negotiate because the damn COVID restrictions, you know, that they they can't get close enough that, that you know he can hear them make their proposals. Well, it's the kind of thing that, you know, your drunk uncle, you know, in his 70s used to do uh, you know, at Thanksgiving dinner. You know, he doesn't really know too much about that. It sounds like he watched one lecture on the Ukraine uh Russia conflict, and then he just decided, oh, I'll find a way to piece this together with all the stuff that I already hate. And yeah, we'll throw that out there and we'll simplify the world a little bit by suggesting that this very complicated geopolitical conflict that's taking place in the part of the world where I really don't have a lot of knowledge, it's all part of the same struggle anyway. So no need to learn anything new, no need to actually delve into the history of the region, no need to actually even learn what a lot of the actors actually think. Let's just say it's yet another struggle against the woke mod and praise postmodern conservative fascists for standing up for Christian civilization against the tides of liberal activists in Russia who are going to bring the country down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we all know, liberalizing Russia would be just an awful thing. You know, well, that's the, like, um, had a good conversation about this with Stefan Bertram Lee. It's like the, uh, I think, uh, let's put it this way. People who actually know something about Russia and, and Ukraine don't think that either of those societies are particularly suffering from an excess of wokeness. Um, no. You know. <laughs> and, and I think a society where you go to jail for opposing a war that was launched for the most frivolous reasons isn't exactly a society that's suffering from an excess of liberal norms either, right? 
No, definitely not. Uh, and and uh, so you know, there's a there's a short essay that I, I know this is somebody who I'm sure lots of viewers will have various feelings about, but put those aside for a second. The uh, that Jesse Sigal wrote for the Spectator, I think it came out like a few days ago or something. At least I saw it then. Uh, called the rise of the anti woke weirdos, where he he sort of uh, makes the case that there's like a certain kind of person, and he like very politely doesn't name any names. You know, in the essay, yeah. uh, who, you know, maybe has like legitimate grief grievances with sort of like you know campusy or other institution, you know, like media, maybe you know, kind of kind of old culture. Maybe they were like canceled for spurious reasons. Maybe they did something that was kind of bad, but like not that bad, right? And and and, and they and they were you know treated badly, uh, and. Uh, and then, you know, the people they used to hang out with didn't like them anymore, and right-wing culture warriors embraced them, and inevitably, you know, that uh, they, you know, they gravitated towards their new friends. And and he says that, like, the thing about these people is that, like, since this becomes their sort of origin story, that becomes, like, the prison they see everything through, right? So it's like every stupid little th- thing in the world, everything that happens in the world, you see through this one stupid little prism of, like, you know, this like these particular aspects of like the American culture war, which it turns out is just not a very good explanation of like most things that happen in the world. No, it's extraordinarily overdetermining uh, one particular social phenomena. Now, look, you know, I have my problems with woke culture, as I know you do sure. as well, right? Uh, I think books like Canceling Comedians While the World Burns are very useful interventions because we've all met somebody online where we just think like, fucking, you know, yeah, yeah. you're the last person I need in my team because it's just kind of embarrassing having to put up with you, right? Now yeah. saying that, I would never sit there and have a couple of bad encounters with really obnoxious, annoying people and <laughs> decide I'm just going to change my entire political orientation. But there are some people who do, uh, and I think we need to be attentive to that on the left. But then there are people who, like uh, this article seems to be implying, who just go completely in the opposite direction. Uh, and everything becomes seen through the filter of this culture war dynamic. And some of it can get really quite ridiculous, right? Uh, especially when you're try, yeah. trying to feed back uh, to the audience that created you or that introduced you to that community. And, you know, just to bring it back to somebody like Peterson, when he tweeted out that comment about the plus size model on Sports Illustrated, oh my God, by the way, yes. I thought she was a you know, very pretty woman. Sure. Uh, nothing wrong but like, with that. But, right? like, but, like, but like if, you know, I mean, if Peterson doesn't think so, fine. I mean, like, like, like there are, you know, I mean, they're, they're like, you know, the sort of like many different kinds of people find many different kinds of people attractive or don't, right? I mean, like that's not actually a crisis. Including a lot of his audience who sat there and being like, dude, my girlfriend or wife looks like that, right? Like what the right, fuck right, are you right, doing? Right, right. And that's it. It's like, look, this woman never did anything to you. As far as I know, she's probably never fucking read anything of yours, right? Why yeah. make an issue out of this, right? You're just sitting there lashing out at something that has absolutely fucking nothing to do with you or really nothing at all to fucking do with anything uh, related to what you're dealing with, except very tangentially in the sense that Sports Illustrated is trying to, you know, present different kind of female bodies. Yeah, on which, which, which is also like, it's not, that's not because that's not because like they like some political commitment, right? Like, oh, that no. they, that they, they're trying to, it's, it's, this is just like, you know, you either, I mean, look, you know, ride with markets, die with markets, you know, like they, uh, you, you, if you, if you're going to valorize market forces, as Peterson often seems to, he, I haven't watched the entirety of what we're about to watch. I will say that in, in part of it, he strikes a much more moderate tone on that than he has in other places, but they have a, but if you're going to valorize market forces as much as Peterson sometimes does, I mean, look, part of how markets work is that like, if there's a if there's a consumer base for for something you don't like, you know, people will still cater to it. No, absolutely. And I mean, let's not give Sports Illustrated any kind of credit here because they've sat there and they've exploited and uh, fetishized women's bodies for a very long time. Sure. And we could talk about how that might have had a negative impact from a feminist perspective. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't believe at all that they put this model up there because they thought it was the right thing to do, right? They probably thought, well, there's money to be made and these are the way the winds are blowing, so let's do that, right? It's just a very bizarre instance uh, of a guy lashing out uh, at a very, very peripheral target and rightly getting a lot of criticism for doing that. But one of the things that I wanted to say that's really ironic about this, and this is, I guess, a bit more of a theoretical point, 
is that it really smacks of exactly the kind of Nietzschean resentiment that he spent uh. so much of his time criticizing on the political left. This idea that the culture is slipping away from you, that it's unfair, uh, that you deserve to be in your position of dominance or hegemony uh. atop of the cultural pyramid, uh, and you just increasingly start to lash out uh, at all the people that you feel are victimizing you by taking away something that you feel is yours. Uh, and Wendy Brown wrote a really good book about this called In the Ruins of Neoliberalism, where she mm. talks about resentment on the right. Mentioned it before, don't want to go into it again, right? But you really see it just spectacularly on display when he was responding to people criticizing him for making that comment, where rather than saying, you know what, maybe I bet it went a bit too far by attacking this poor woman who just wanted to appear on a fucking magazine cover and make a little bit of money. Uh, he yeah. was like, this medium is disgusting. I have been attacked and I have been insulted. I have been slandered. Yeah, you almost picture like the Christ image, right? Of, you know, him yeah, just, like, yeah. there with like the holes through his hand. And therefore I am leaving for all of whatever it was a day. It's like, dude, you fucking attacked this woman in the first place, right? Did you think that people yeah. were going to chomp back at you? I mean, if you can't fucking take it, don't try to dish it. Yeah, right. I mean, especially because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're going after somebody's personal appearance, right? I mean, it's pretty, uh, yeah. you know, which which is also like, by the way, right? I mean, just from a sort of, um, you know, a sort of like, let's say mildly culturally conservative uh, perspective that I'm, I I think I'm enough of a normie deep down to, you know, to sort of feel like I have a, it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, don't, you know, it's like, don't run your mouth like that about a woman. That's not good matters. And two, um, like, you know what strikes me as like a much bigger violation of traditional norms and, uh, and sort of like um, how, you know, people, you know, how you want people to behave in that sense uh, would be doing a podcast with your daughter about how <laughs> upset you were that you didn't find the cover model hot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was definitely a little bit um, off the beaten path. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Right? Uh, but I mean, he's always been willing to bust certain kind of taboos where he feels that's appropriate. And his audience, uh, at least the loyalists, seem willing to go with him wherever he travels. Uh, but I do think that that says something that's important about the nature of conservatism uh, that Coy Robin and others bring up, right? Uh, there's this misunderstanding that conservatism is primarily about conserving, right? Maintaining things that the way they the way they are, uh, particularly uh, yeah. traditional norms about being polite and traditional norms about how you treat people. Conservatism yeah. is fundamentally at its essence about maintaining uh, or establishing, and the establishing bit is important, certain kinds of power relations uh, over others, and particularly highly stratified hierarchical power relations yeah. over others. And so conservatives have always been willing to even adopt a kind of pseudo-punk ethos uh, uh, where they think that's appropriate. And Peterson is no different. Uh, you know, I'm reading uh, a book recently about the rise of the political right in the 1950s, and Bill Buckley uh, used to go around thumbing his nose at authority figures in universities and kind of presented himself as almost a countercultural figure, right? Striking yeah. against <laughs> the evils of the liberal establishment at Yale, you know, with all of its tyrannies, right? Um, yeah. and Peterson is no different that way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, and, you know, they, they have both, well, all right. Uh, Buckley Peterson is an interesting comparison to make, but we are getting close to uh, to eight thirty. We should uh, we should start off the uh, uh, we should start off the debate. I should say um, so. I think we've got the video queued up to start start after most of the explanation that Kyle gives in advance at the beginning. Uh, but you know, it's uh, we're calling it a debate because this is the Thursday night debate breakdown, and because you know that's what Crystal Kyle and friends called it. You know when they they released it. But uh, it's it's sort of a debate. It's it's a it's a conversation with some disagreements. Uh, I think my I haven't watched the whole thing. My sense is more disagreements as it goes on. Um, but I should say part of what actually makes the part I watched interesting is that you know some of the you know I I, I think we've both laid pretty bare how we feel about Jordan Peterson, and uh, there's a lot of stuff about there's a lot of non-political stuff about Peterson that, you know, I tend to roll my eyes at that, you know, that Kyle Kalinske is, is much friendlier towards that. I, I am like, he disagrees with all the right wing political views, of course, but, uh, but, but, but I think he's much more willing to give a respectful hearing to, or sort of see some insight in, um, you know, Peterson's 
you know, Peterson's thoughts about psychology and, you know, and, and maybe even some of the sort of Jungian mystical stuff um, than, than I am or, you know, or I think you are, but, uh, but, but, but in some ways that, that might actually make a more interesting conversation because that kind of draws out, you know, Peterson a little bit at the, uh, at, at the beginning. And then they, they do, again, even in the part I've already seen, they do, they do butt heads uh, quite a bit, you know, on, um, you know, a lot of Peterson's right wing political views. Although there's also, you know, I mean, Kyle, who I should say, um, you know, I don't particularly know the guy. I've had like one conversation with him on, on that same show, but uh, you know, but I, I, I think he, I think he's a guy who's on point much more than not. You know, I, I, I like a lot of his commentary. I, I think he did the second best debate with Charlie Kirk. Uh, so uh, I, I think, um, you know, I think he's like a good left political communicator, but he's also not somebody who's, you know, spent a lot of time uh, sort of tracking Peterson's, uh, you know, like, like I think he like watched some of his lectures and kind of liked them, but then doesn't like some of his politi- political views, right? I think that's where he's coming from. Not like, oh, I've been like arguing with, you know, arguing with this guy and, you know, and, and you know, sort of from the left and, you know, in the kind of way that we and other people have since like 2018, right? He's not coming at it from that perspective. So sometimes like with, with some of the political views, some of them obviously he's aware of and he's sort of prepared, like, you know, okay, here's the point where we're going to argue about this a little bit, but some of them he's a little surprised by as they come up. So I think that's probably good background for um, what we're going to see. But uh, yeah, we should, I want to try to, if possible, get through the whole thing. Uh, I don't know if that will be or not, but let's, uh, you know, we'll probably try to watch big chunks of it and not stop too much all the time. But, you know, there'll be points I know where we're going to want to stop more, but in any case, let's get started. I don't worry, Basically, I'll, I'll pray to uh, the father in. of order. So <laughs> there you go. And I will squeeze in suck. in our limited time and uh, really looking forward to this. So everybody, please enjoy. Here's Dr. Jordan Peterson. Dr. Jordan Peterson, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, we were close to doing it in the winter, but then I mean, you have a very busy schedule and you had um, a whole tour that you were doing. And so we had to put it off to the summer. But Thank you again, because you're a man of your word. You said, hey, by the summer, we'll be able to do it. And, and you came through. So thanks for joining us. I'm pleased to do it. I'm glad we were able to arrange it. Yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about. Um, whenever I hear you talk about uh, psychology and philosophy, I'm always floored by it. I watched your entire 2017 lecture series. I basically feel like I was a student in the class. And um, I thought it was brilliant. Which one? So, was that the, the Maps of Meaning or are they biblical lectures? Maps of Meaning. Oh, yeah. And so where you went through all the different psychologists and, and their different philosophies. And um, so there's a bunch of stuff I want to ask you on that. And then later on, maybe we'll get into the more political and religious realm where we have uh, some disagreements. But let's start with this. Um, I took the, you know how you're always talking about the big five traits? Yeah. I, um, I took that test. Understand and, myself. What's that? The understand myself test? Yes, whatever the, I think I just Googled like big five trait test or something and whatever the first one that came up was I took and then it scored you. Well, that was probably a mistake, but that's okay. Oh, that's not the right test? Well, I have a test online at understandmyself.com and it's accurate and it gives you a good report and it details the five traits down to 10 aspects, two aspects per trait. And if you have a partner and they do it, that gives you a couples report too that tells you why you'll fight and why you need to. (laughs) how you need to appreciate each other for similarities and differences. So anyway, so, it doesn't matter. Well, perhaps, perhaps I took uh, the wrong test, but on this particular test that I took, um, it said that I was very high in conscientiousness, moderately high in mm-hmm. agreeableness, which I was actually shocked by. I thought I was more disagreeable than agreeable, but apparently I'm not. Um, it says mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. somewhat low in openness, um, low in extroversion, and I'm very low in neuroticism. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... When I look at those traits, and correct me if I'm wrong, that strikes me like I, I lean more temperamentally conservative, but my politics are actually more left. So it seems to me like there's a little bit of a contradiction there. So can you speak on that a little bit? And then also tell me what your results are on that test. Yeah, well, generally, the best predictor of a more liberal orientation is high openness. Um, 
I, it's hard for me to believe that you're not extroverted or open given what you do. So I would say you should probably take a different test. Although I don't know which one you took. And you might've taken a valid one. I, I can't mm. say for sure. Um, it, it's easy to put tests up. It's hard to make them valid. Um, yeah, generally speaking, the more entrepreneurial and creative types tend to lean more liberal. And the reason for that, and that's especially true if they're lower in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, and the reason for that seems to be that imagine that people might differ in their biologically predisposed attitude towards information flow and the flow of, of people as well. And the more conservative types are more concerned about the potential disruption and danger of novel ideas and new people. And there's good reason for that because new people and novel ideas can really flip the apple cart upside down. And Whereas liberal people, more liberal people, are energized and interested in the exchange of ideas, and they are willing to take the risk of disruption to gain the benefit of novelty and, and new learning. And you can't say which one's right, because sometimes new ideas are absolutely dreadfully destructive. Karl Marx's ideas might be a good case in point. They're they make sense once you accept a certain set of axioms, but they're unbelievably destructive when implemented. And so that deviation from tradition was an absolute catastrophe. But then, you know, on the positive front, well, everybody's pretty happy they have electric lights. That's not a political issue, obviously. But so sometimes if you welcome new ideas, you're right. And sometimes if you resist them, you're right. And that's partly why we have a political dialogue, right? So that we can adjudicate between these two different claims. Out of curiosity, would you say that there are any of Marx's ideas or any of his critiques of capitalism that you think have merit? Well, the idea that capitalism produces inequality is clearly true, but hmm. Marx didn't think that up. I mean, that's been known forever. It says in the gospels that the poor will always be with us. I mean, inequality is an unbelievably pervasive economic problem. The problem with Marx's critique, and the left-wingers should take this seriously, and I mean seriously, and they don't. So imagine that part of the reason that you're left-wing, I don't mean you specifically, but possibly you, because you're also somewhat higher in compassion, you said, in agreeableness. The lefties are concerned about the detrimental effects of inequality, say unequal distribution of capital and financial resources in particular, although there's all sorts of inequalities of distribution. And they are right to be concerned about that because when equality becomes excessive, it tends to destabilize societies. So we know, for example, that in neighborhoods where movement up the socioeconomic hierarchy is blocked and difficult, and there's quite an extreme range between poor and rich, that young men tend to become violent because that's one of the ways they can attain status when they can't attain it in a legitimate, let's say, and productive status as competition and so and every society that's ever existed have, has had to deal with the potential negative consequences of inequality so back in old testament times the hebrews had a jubilee every seven years i think it was the jubilee but it, it doesn't matter um, where debts were erased mm. and forgiven and the reason for that was that capital wealth tends to accumulate in the hands of a smaller and smaller number of people now, Marx was right in that diagnosis, although he did not, he was not the originator of that idea by any stretch of the imagination. But laying at the feet of capitalism is, it's preposterous and it understates the magnitude of the problem. Because if you're concerned about inequality, and there are reasons to be concerned in, in an intelligent manner, then you want to get the diagnosis right. And if you blame it on capitalism, you've got the diagnosis wrong. Because every economic system ever devised by human beings has produced inequality, but only one has produced an increase in material prosperity, especially for poor people, and that's free market capitalism. So the lefties who follow Marx because they're concerned about inequality are guilty of the sin of not taking the problem that's cardinal to them with anywhere near the requisite degree of seriousness. Inequality is a way deeper problem than than mere capitalism and getting rid of capitalism is you think what you think the soviet union or maoist china was egalitarian it was just as unequal so is cuba 
and so is Venezuela. I mean, these places that purport to be egalitarian are anything but. It's the problem of, you know, All right, Matt, additional thoughts? Well, I mean, it's a pretty ridiculous characterization of Marx that once again testifies the fact that I just don't think he's ever bothered to read him in any depth because obviously inequality is pre-existed capitalism. And in fact, one of the things that's interesting about Marxism is precisely this periodization that accounts for various different forms inequality has taken over history. Marx's point, uh, interestingly enough, is of course that he agrees with Peterson, uh, at least superficially on the point that under capitalism, what's emerged for the first time are conditions of material surplus uh, that would allow for us to give everyone a reasonably high quality of life. That's one of the reasons he celebrated it, along with mm -hmm. Engels in the Communist Manifesto, using not even praising, but actually euphoric <clears throat> language, right, about you know all fixed, fast, frozen relations being undone and a kind of new world awaiting us. Really, what's at the essence of Marx's critique of political economy isn't even really a concern with equality from a moral point of view, which he often kind of right. slandered as a bourgeois set of considerations, so much as with the contradictory dynamics of capitalism that lead to these periodic crises uh, where things go up and down, and then the political, uh, political ramifications that would come from that. Uh, now, there are a lot of different aspects to this, uh, and it's very complicated, and it takes different forms depending on the book that you're looking at. But in many ways, uh, he was a great pioneer uh, in anticipating things like the business cycle and the way that capitalism periodically enters recessionary periods. And that's why, again, as I stress this continuously, he was engaged in a critique of political economy, not a moralistic condemnation uh, of inequality. Uh, and the irony is that I actually think he didn't take things like inequality seriously enough from a moral point of view. And I wish he'd actually spent more time talking about what a just distribution uh, of goods would have looked like something like G.A. Cohen does later on. Yeah. I mean, as you know, uh, since I, I talked about it in the talk that I, I gave uh, at um, what was then still known at Ryerson uh, when I was in, uh, when I was in Toronto, um, you know, I, I do think that the, the university formerly known as Ryerson. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I do think that the, um, that, the few things that Marx does say about that last subject and the critique of the Gotha program are, are, are interested and, and I think even sort of interestingly anticipate some of what Cohen and other 20th century thinkers would say about that. But he certainly doesn't say much about it, right? That's 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 very fair. Um, no, and as you pointed out before, right, he even dismisses the idea of equality uh, as an extremely abstract and spurious one, precisely because people are so different in the way that Peterson describes, right? What would it even mean to make people equal uh, when one of them has a disability and another doesn't. Uh, does that mean that you both tell them that they have an equal opportunity to walk upstairs? Like, yeah, yeah. No, there are all kinds of complex variables uh, that you have to account for there. And so that's why I says we need to move on to a different way uh, of conceiving of the economic structures that underpin our society and a different way of conceiving of the distributional apparatus that will be entrenched uh, atop of different ways of producing goods. Now, all this is something that we don't really have to get into too sure. much, uh, but it's just so frustrating that rather than actually having one of those dialogues that he harps on about so much and saying, look, you know, these are the technical points of Marxism I disagree with, or this is why I think that it's underpinning Hegelian uh, approach to history, for example, is just bunk. We just get like these very, very generic, very superficial, uh, and at this point, extremely tired talking points. Yeah, I, I mean, so, so I, I do think it's worth, noted about Marx, like it's it's one thing to say, well, there's a lot of sort of, I don't know. I mean, if you read the um, you know, if you read Capital during the that sort of epic chapter on the working day, like some of the uh some of the examples that he's picking are things like um, you know, seamstresses who are dying because they're being overworked for long hours and in horrible conditions to uh uh, to make dresses for like aristoc aristocratic London ladies to go to the ball with, you know, and so it's like, you know, there's a, you know, there does seem to be a implicit dislike of the level of inequality generated by uh, by, by capitalist economic structures uh, in there for sure, but uh, but you know, I also take your point that the like explicit normative notion invoked by by Marx is is pretty much never that, right? I mean, it's it's. Um, 
to to the extent that he does explicit normative talk at all, right? It's it's freedom, not equality, uh, that he's that he's he's invoking, right? That like um, understood in this you know kind of implicitly sort of small r Republican way, freedom from domination or sort of allowing for human flourishing that's that's uh, that's inhibited, you know, by uh, by by existing social systems. But I mean, like that's the you know like to the extent that Marx is really invoking a normative concept, it's that. And also, like, okay, the bit of Marx that Peterson claims to have read is the Communist Manifesto, um, you know, that he he infamously said in, in uh, the debate with Slavo in 2019 that he'd, he'd just reread it for the first time since he was 18. And, like, the first s- sentence of the first chapter, right? Like, the first sentence of the introduction is the thing about the specter haunting Europe, but the first sentence of the first chapter is the thing about um, the uh, you know history of all hitherto ex- all hitherto existing history is the history of class struggle, and so it's like yeah, I'm pretty sure he knows that all the previous you know all the you know that the that that you know society that systems that predated capitalism you know involved involved inequality and specifically class inequality, and that's that's not a you know that's not something that's not on Marx's radar. And then yeah, the other point you made I think is maybe just worth saying one more time, just to circle and underline it, which is yes, capitalism also creates uh, tremendous material resources. That's Marx's point, right? That the that uh, that like this, unlike you know to a much greater extent than previous forms of class society, it you know creates this this bounty of material resources uh, that have. Um, uh, that um, that you know that creates the possibility you know for uh, for a better you know for a better kind of society like that's that just that just seems like if you don't know that much like you didn't even pay very close attention to uh, to the the very short pamphlet you know that that's the uh, that's the, the communist manifesto so yeah I, I think you know from 2019 to 2022 his his understanding of Marx certainly hasn't gotten any better. No, absolutely not. And I want to say, uh, just in case people think I'm picking on Marx by complaining that he wasn't a moral philosopher, he could have been yeah. a very good moral philosopher he had chosen to, because every time he does step into that field, he's very effective at it. Uh, one of the best examples uh, that I can think of is late in Das Kapital, Volume 1. Uh, he gives a very, very effective critique of John Locke, where he says that Locke develops this labor theory of entitlement. Uh, not a labor theory of value, but of entitlement. Uh, that's still extremely uh, ideologically important today in places like the United States, uh, where there's this idea that if you work hard, you should get something. Or, or if you want to be more precise, if you mix your labor with something, then it becomes yours. Uh, and you saw people like Ben Shapiro appeal to these notions all the time when they say the government shouldn't come and take what's mine. You know, I made this, uh, I built it, it belongs to me. And Marx just very cleverly says, well, if you actually believe that labor creates an entitlement, then why is it that the capitalists are the ones who get everything when they're not the ones who are going into the coal mines, hauling up the coal, building the you know steel rigs that allow you to extract it in the first place, you know sitting there you know building the coke furnaces that then smelt the iron, which then and you know the list goes on, right? Uh, and he points out if you consistently apply this idea that labor creates entitlement, then there's no other way to conceive of capitalists except as a parasitic class. Uh, and then he goes on to say. This is, of course, you know, the logical extension uh, of Locke's ideas. I'm not here to criticize Locke because I have better things to do. And then he moves on. Uh, but he's absolutely right about this, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's worth noting that F.A. Hayek, uh, amongst others, later acknowledged the force of this kind of objection and said in the Constitution of Liberty, yeah, this is why we shouldn't be relying on these kind of meritocratic labor-oriented right. accounts of why people should get things because it's always going to lead them to at least become, uh, to use the technical allowance, Ricardian socialists, right? That the workers should right. get the actual value of their labor. Uh, yeah, yeah. We need to do away with all that kind of stuff, right? So Marx could have been a very good moral philosopher if he had chosen to. He was very gifted at it. He just had bigger fish to fry. And it's up to the G.A. Collins and the John Rawls of the world to help fill in the gaps in his analysis on that point. Fair and enough. Sadly, you know, <laughs> we're not going to advance that quite interesting debate uh, any further by having to deal with people like this. Uh, he would just don't really seem to be all that interested in engaging in those kind of subtleties at all. Absolutely. All right, let's keep going. Oh, actually, sorry. I I, I feel really remiss if I don't say this. I would really one one thing I I really you know it's easy to not think of this stuff in the moment, but Monday night quarterback in this. Uh, one thing I really wish that uh, that Kyle had had asked there is okay. Let's talk about that. 
Jubilee thing. Like, do you, do you think we should have something like that now? Like that would have been interesting. Yeah, I know. It's like we're constantly calling for a restoration of Judeo-Christian values. How about, you know, debt-free day every seven years? We'll go talk to the major credit card companies about that. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's well, a fucking very, nice very Fight Club moment, moment, right? Just like, so, oh, everybody yeah, goes so back to debt. Mark is right to point to it as a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Problem, hmm. but completely wrong in his diagnosis. Right. I mean, I accept a lot of what you say there. And, you know, a lot of the governments you brought up, like Venezuela, for example, I would definitely categorize them as authoritarian and and not egalitarian but to accept your premise further here when you talk about capitalism um you know that inequality is going to exist no matter what system we're under is effectively the argument how would you respond to the point that there have been times throughout u.s history where that inequality has been significantly less and then that also led to what was called the golden age of economic expansion in the u.s so for example uh under fdr and the new deal um they did a lot of redistribution of wealth through social programs. A lot of these New Deal projects uh, had shovel-ready jobs, and they put the country to work in the midst of the Great Depression. And they also increased taxes on the wealthy, for example. Um, do you look at a model like that and think it makes sense? In other words, like a, a regulated version of capitalism as opposed to capitalism? Well, there has to be. There has to be regulations. Okay. There, mm -hmm. there has to be. There has to be a a system of law in place for a free market to even work right i mean so for example so the you have to be guaranteed property rights for example you have to be guaranteed freedom of association you have to be treated as if you have intrinsic worth all of those things have to be enshrined in law so you need an underlying operating system in some sense that's axiomatic and constitutional in order for a free market economy to even get off the ground and we don't exactly know what those prerequisites are. Some of them appear to be theological and some of them appear to be philosophical and, and legal. So the theological presuppositions would be what the, what the founders of the American enterprise were referring to when they said that they held these truths to be self-evident. And so, mm. and those self-evident truths had to do with the dignity and value of each individual and their intrinsic worth before the law and say in some sense before god and the self-evidence of that is a consequence of a theological underpinning and then out of that arises i would just like to say something framework that guarantees yeah <laughs> this is one of the things that bugs me uh also about him which is this extremely chauvinistic and ahistorical approach to capitalism that privileges the Western experience uh, and ideological defense of capitalism over all others, uh, and not even doing that all that effectively. Because let's be very clear, there were plenty of ideological defenders of capitalism who insisted that it had nothing to do with a commitment to human equality. Uh, and that goes way back to the 19th century with people like Herbert Spencer, who actually praised the market for being a sorting mechanism to actually, uh, for the first time, rank people according to what they actually deserve. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of Spencer's points, right? That every other system that has existed hitherto has been one where people have kind of entrenched privileges for themselves where they didn't deserve them because they didn't have to continuously compete for them and that there were laws in place that allowed them to maintain positions of privilege that they didn't actually deserve. Now in the market, you have to sink or swim by your own merits and the big fish are going to eat the little fish and the sharks are going to eat everyone. And that's exactly the kind of society we should have, right? And that later on appears in people like Ayn Rand, who also emphatically reject the idea of human equality, right? I mean, Ludwig Bionis' most famous uh, letter to her uh, praised Atlas Shrugged because she was the one who apparently had the gall to tell the people, which no one, what no one else had the gall to tell them during the kind of FDR New Deal era, which is that most of the people are inferior uh, and any improvement in their conditions that they experience, they owe to those, and I quote, were better than them. Right. So capitalism, even in a Western context, has not needed any notion of human equality, theologically or otherwise, to get better. Far, far, far from it. And that's saying nothing, of course, about the vast uh, imperialist and racist projects that capitalism depended upon, certainly early in its mm -hmm. history, all of which were justified ideologically on very, very rigid forms of human stratification. Uh, I right. mean, if you think even about the American project that he was talking about, 
America never would have gotten off the ground if people like Jefferson who could sit there, write all men are created equal one day, and then the very next one go back and exploit their slaves and say, let's advance westward and get rid of those natives because they don't deserve the land because they're doing nothing with for it because they're savages, right? Yeah. None of that kind of comes in here. It's a very bizarre kind of approach even to the early history of capitalism. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. These people, the liberty and autonomy and and security, especially with regards to property rights, that enables free enterprise and the acquisition of wealth to begin. And that would also um, involve prohibitions against arbitrary seizure of, well, of property. So, right. because otherwise, see, if some people, if, if we set up a system where no one can get rich, like exceptionally rich, let's say, we also set up a system where no one can, where everyone can't become wealthy. Some people have to become wealthy first. You know that already, you know, like when something like flat screen TVs were introduced or, or uh, cell phones for that matter, for the first cell phones, for the first five years, they were the playthings of extremely wealthy billionaires. And the reason for that was the technology was extremely expensive to begin with. And unless there was a market that was supplied by people with excess capital, there, the marketing of the product couldn't have begun and the price couldn't have been lowered. That's true, but didn't NASA also do a lot of the original investing that gave us the internet? Wasn't the yeah, space program sure. responsible for a lot of the original? So in other words, it's, it's sure. sort of a hybrid of both public and private sector. Yeah, well, you see that hybrid model in places like Canada. You see it and in places like, like the Scandinavian countries. But we should Correct. point out with regard to the Scandinavian countries that mm. if you look at international rankings of the degree to which it is easy to do business in a given country, right. the Scandinavian countries constantly rank in the top 10 or 20. And That's so they have, a, they have a social net put in place, but they're mm -hmm. fundamentally free market capitalist economies. So, and you know, we have to fight all the time about the balance between providing people with equality of opportunity and also providing them with the requisite security that also aids and abets that. So mm. here's an example. So Canada has a, a healthcare system that's more socialized than the system in the US. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to that. Canada spends less on hospital administration than the US does. So that's an interesting and somewhat unexpected fact. We ration healthcare in Canada by waiting times and it can be quite brutal. So my daughter, for example, had to get uh, her ankle replaced at one point and the waiting list in Canada was three years. And she was walking around with a broken ankle. So three years was untenable. So there, it's rationed by waiting time in a manner analogous to the manner in which healthcare is rationed by wealth in countries that have a less socialized system. Correct. However, yeah. mm -hmm. it's also the case that Canada has a higher per capita entrepreneurial rate than the US. And one of the reasons for that appears to be that people can step outside of their current jobs and the security that those jobs offer them and undertake the risk of establishing a new venture because they don't have to worry that their family now has lost its healthcare security. Mm -hmm. So these things are complicated, right? They have to be dealt with on a, in some sense at a detailed level and on a case by case basis. But if you want to point to the Scandinavian countries, what you see there is, well, a, a, a free market capitalist framework with a constitutional underpinning, and then some argument about how much of a social security net can be cast out of that free enterprise web to provide people with a reasonable amount of security. I'd just yeah, like to say yeah, a, a bit of a partisan point here. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons uh, that I tend to endorse the Scandinavian model, uh, a kind of liberal socialism, right, is because I think that they're the aspirational countries, right? They're what people on the left, uh. especially the economic left, should look to and say, this works and we can build upon that. doesn't mean we have to necessarily emulate it, but if it works, build upon that. Yeah. Right? Uh, but it's worth noting that this wasn't achieved uh, through reform, uh, and this is something that people don't quite understand uh, about the Scandinavian countries, uh, and particularly people who will say things like, well, the reason that welfareism functions there as effectively as it does is because they're culturally homogenous societies. Actually, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that Sweden was one of the most unequal and aristocratic societies in Europe uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, I kid you not, uh, if you were a lord, 
uh, in a rural district in Sweden, you could have a hundred times the voting power uh, as even a very wealthy person in the same district uh, when it came to running for represent to be representatives uh, in the parliament, right? Uh, and sometimes this could lead to very funny results. So in one case, there was a Swedish lord who cast one ballot for himself. Everyone else cast a ballot against him, and he still was elected, right? <laughs> Extraordinary stratification, right? Yeah, it's quite the election, right? Uh, yeah. And it took decades uh, of fierce struggle on the part of labor movements, on the part of socialists, communists, Marxists, you name it, uh, in order to bring about what's sometimes called the Grand Compromise in Scandinavia, where capitalists agreed to cede a tremendous amount of power to workers and establish the Nordic welfare states, uh, often under the jurisdiction of social democratic and socialist parties, uh, and in return, certain kinds of private business would be left intact. Uh, now, in the 1970s, there was an even more ambitious effort to try to transition to a full socialized economy that we talked a little bit about, the Meidner plan, which I think it's worth trying to experiment with that again, and Thomas Piketty would agree. Uh, and capital would have none of that, right? Uh, but you know, my point with this kind of broader narrative is that this kind of utopian vision of the Scandinavian countries as just experimenting uh, with welfareism because it's what works discounts the fact that there were real struggles to achieve uh, these kinds of transformations. And they are extraordinarily fragile, and capitalists always tried to roll them back wherever right. it is that they could, and certainly didn't want to see them advance any kind of any further. Yeah, and I mean that last point I think is why um, you know I, I mean look I, I think that you don't get Scandinavia without um, you know to a, to a great extent that's a you know that that represents the you know obviously incomplete accomplishments of people who were fighting for for. Uh, socialism in a sense that would come after capitalism. Uh, I'm not sure that you get it without that. And certainly, uh, you know, I think that last point, which is a big theme of Bhaskar Sankara's uh, the Socialist Manifesto. Yeah, that's where I got it from. So, yeah. <laughs> Shout is, out to Bhaskar if you listen, right? I'm sorry I plagiarized you there, but I'm glad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think you're supposed to. But uh, the, uh, uh, but, you know, that, that you can't, if you stop, you know, like if you stop at that card in order to halfway house. Right, you know, it's it's very vulnerable to being rolled back, right? So for that sort of pragmatic reason, if nothing else, it's worth you know it's worth pushing onwards, you know, to deeper uh, structural transformation and democratization of the economy, which is you know, but like yeah, I mean, I I think the you know Nordic model is a giant step in the right direction for sure, you know, and and, and extremely aspirational for us in North America, uh, and and I think that like. I did just want to address what Peterson said earlier because I think he was kind of mindlessly repeating some standard right wing talking points, even though it maybe got lost a little bit because the sort of general tenor of so much of what he said in the last bit sounded kind of reasonable. You know, he's conceding that the Canadian healthcare system has its advantages, you know, et cetera. But uh, with his first comment about the Nordics earlier, you know, he said, well, look, these economic freedom rankings, you know, rank them very high and show that it's like very easy to start a business there and all this stuff. And that really could not be more misleading. Uh, so I I would point people to an article I wrote for Jack a bit about the Fraser Institute, which is a big sort of soft libertarianish uh, Canadian think tanks, freedom rankings that a lot of uh, a lot of libertarians love. Um, which are one of the ones that you know that that like rank the uh, the Nordics very high, and like do a pretty deep dive in there about the sort of absurd methodology of of these rankings, you know, because so much of it has nothing to do with what social democrats, socialists, and, and conservatives are actually arguing about, right? In the uh, in, in the normal course of things, right? Like the kind of regulations, you know, when people say, oh, there aren't very many regulations, or it's 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 pretty you know economically free in that free market sense that makes it sound like the kind of regulations you're talking about the lack of or like you know labor laws environmental laws whatever you know rather than um most of you know to some so to some extent the rank some of these rankings put the thumb on the scale by like counting like rule of law you know as make you know like mm -hmm. as making things more economically free because like well if there's a lot of chaos or you know if there are like frequent military coups uh, then that's like bad for the business climate. It's like okay, right? But like, uh, it's 
you know, but socialists don't want there to be lots of corruption and, and military coups, right? Like that's that's not part of what's in dispute between you and socialists, right? It's not a test, you know, you're you're putting the cart before the horse there, right? I mean, it'd be one thing to argue for capitalism on the grounds that it led to less of that if that were true, but uh, it's very different to sort of count that as somehow making a society more capitalist. And in particular, Matt Brunig has written some good stuff about this. When they talk about the sort of easier to to start a business stuff, what they really mean is that like, when you're starting to do business, you know, in the United States, certainly, um, you know, you you do have to fill out a lot more paperwork than uh, than in say Sweden. But or when you move there, I have to say, uh, to start a new career, I'm fucking dealing with that right now, and it's a goddamn nightmare. Sure. Anybody I who mean, says you just walk into that country is completely bullshitting you. Yeah, no, that's fair. But uh, uh, but I, I do think, right, this is a, like the point that Brunig makes is that like in the business example, it's like, okay, first of all, not only is that not something that's not in dispute between the left and the, you know, like it's not like socialists are going around advocating, making people fill out more pieces of paperwork to start a business in the first place. But the reason why you have to do more paperwork in the United States than say Sweden uh, is because of American federalism, right? Different layers, different levels of government you have to do things for. Whereas some of those Northern European societies where you have to do much less, you know, yeah, it's because they're so much more centralized, which is not something that conservatives and libertarians usually advocate. No, absolutely. Uh, and it's worth noting again, looking at how you measure economic freedom really depends on a lot of different variables, uh, which when you privilege, of course, is going to skew the score quite a bit. So for instance, Germany is often considered to be one of the most economically free countries in the world. Uh, and there are a lot of good things, by the way, we can learn from Germany. Uh, but it's worth noting that the kind of models that are developed that are very pro-capitalist uh, when they come up with these conclusions don't take into account how it is that co-determination is a feature in a lot of determined firms. <laughs> and it's something that's really a wonderful thing that we should experiment with. Uh, what co-determination means is essentially you do have private firms. They are private. They're not owned by the state. Uh, but workers have an equal or at least far higher amount of representation on the boards of these firms uh, and sometimes can even possess veto power. And they use that, of course, in order to try to get better things for their members and for the workers uh, in the firm. And it, this has been widely popular. It's been supported by both major parties for a long time. And you still have a free market that operates on top of it. It's not like these firms aren't interested in making money or making a profit. Uh, if anything, they try to make more of a profit because now the workers have more of an investment in trying to make sure that the firm is successful. Now, that's not something that's very easily captured uh, in these accounts because it's just not something that's really relevant uh, when assessing how free an economy is. Although you'd think it would be if they were being a little bit more honest because um, that kind of proposal, I mean, when, you know, like, look, she's not a politician I'm particularly a fan of, but I mean, like Elizabeth Warren, you know, yep. uh, proposed, you know, things like that in the U.S., like all of the, you know, all the conservatives had heart attacks about it, right? She's she's trying to take over, you know, corporations and make them do her bidding, you know? It's like, well, okay. I mean, like, uh, so so in that kind, you know, you, you guys certainly seem to think that's an assault on economic freedom. So I think a more honest economic freedom ranking, and I'm saying like more honest given their definition of economic freedom, right? Not not what you and I would consider relevant to freedom as it applies to the economy, right? But what they would, right? Like a more a more honest version of that rankings would absolutely hold that against Germany because they'd say, look, they're interfering with the prerogatives of private capital. They're making these corporations uh, let workers have seats on the board, you know, when they don't want to, you know. So um, that's uh, so so yeah, you would you would absolutely um, you know you'd absolutely include that, but you know they it's not uh included because uh because they if you did start to include stuff like that right or like say having a nationalized health healthcare industry uh as uh, as a lot of these places do right you know like you'd think you get some serious economic freedom points off for that but like if you did start including things like that then you wouldn't get all of the correlations they're going for that like all of the good things go with more economic freedom and all the bad things go with less yeah, absolutely. And again, it all really depends on what you prioritize when it is that you try to conceptualize something like economic freedom, right? Uh, there's no doubt that many of the Nordic countries find it easier to do business, but that's in part because they're variably integrated into the Eurozone, uh, which was intended to basically create a giant free trade block where people could move and work as they mm -hmm. please. Uh, and they would share a lot of things in common, and they would also trade more freely with one another. Uh, take the United States as a counterexample yeah. where 
the United States has an extremely complicated system uh, of free trade in some places, tariffs in others, depending upon which focus group um, in Washington happens to have any amount of power at any given time, right? Uh, so there's a lot of things that we can learn from Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, but I'm not necessarily sure that the lessons are the ones that somebody like Jordan Peterson would want us to take away from them. Yeah, I mean, it, it, emphatically not, right? I mean, that point that you mentioned earlier, which is the, um, uh, I I think is is gone into a lot, and not the last Piketty book so much, but the one before that, I think, uh, is um, oh, Capital and Ideology. Yeah, um, yeah, I think I think this is where he talks about this. You know that like, um, that you know that Sweden had been such a almost farcically unequal society, and you know, mm -hmm. and that they. You know, like this is like a, a like yeah the the Swedish welfare state like didn't arise as I remember the late Michael Brooks put it at once you know uh, rolling his eyes right from everybody going to the same Lutheran church or something right you know it it arose from uh, really militant industrial unions engaging in some some you know like pretty hard class struggle for a long time to you know allied with socialist political parties like that's that's how they that's how they won. That kind of uh, that kind of welfare state in the first place. I mean, it's really the only way you could, you know, win yeah. that kind of welfare state in the first place. And that's why it's sometimes called the Grand Compromise, because people uh, sometimes forget that between you know the 1900s and the 1930s, uh, when these kind of models started to emerge, there was a real fear in all these countries uh, that you would see class war erupt, uh, very precisely because they were so unequal. But at the same time, socialist and workers' movements were extremely powerful and were growing and were able to agitate uh, for more and more rights. And so the grand compromise was reached to try to conciliate between both parties and to do so on the basis of mutual respect and a kind of eye to the future where everyone would benefit from a new set of arrangements. But what's sometimes missed in the narratives these right-wingers put forward when they say, well, it's all about culture, it's all about religion, is precisely the fact that nothing was handed to these workers, right? right? Uh, this wasn't the result of some benevolence where the king uh, or the queen or the businessmen in Stockholm sat there and thought, well, we should just give these people a nice welfare state because they deserve it, you know, for being part of our country. You had to fight for it and they did fight for it and we should be doing the same here. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Interested to hear you say this, Dr. Peterson, because I do think it flies in the face of how a lot of people, myself included maybe, uh, viewed your politics because yeah, well, that's because I often, people generally don't have any idea what I think because they just make I assumptions mean, based on idiot journalists, and that's the end of that. I mean, I guess that's a fair point because, um, like, I, I often mention the Scandinavian countries in many respects as it, sort of an ideal. Like, I like social democracy and that I think it's a healthy mix of socialism and capitalism. And I like the idea of thinking of an ideal government as trying to create a better meritocracy. And in order for there to be a better meritocracy, I think in a civilized society, you can take certain things off the table. You can take healthcare off the table. You can take education off the table. Um, and it, I mean, look at it this way. If we're having a hundred yard dash, I kind of want everybody to start at the same place. Whereas oftentimes- No, you, do, you don't want them to start at the same place. Why is you that? You want to start them with the same lack of barriers to their movement forward. So that's, that's a negative that's not rights, the same thing. Do you believe in any positive rights too? Because we all agree there are negative liberties of the government needs to leave me the hell alone in these respects. But aren't there also some positive rights? Isn't there a right to health care, for example? No, there's no right to health care. There's so no right agree with to that. food. So do you well, prefer the US right system to, to, to the socialized medicine systems to single payer health care countries? Well, let's start with the first question first with regard okay. to positive rights. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that you have a right that requires someone else to provide it for you. Yeah, but they, uh, they so have that in France, for just, example. They have a right. This to is a personal pet peeve well, of mine. They... This is a pet peeve of mine because I see this stupid distinction made all the time, uh, mostly by people who've never bothered to read Isaiah Berlin's really quite good essay on positive and negative liberty, uh, and. <laughs> The reality is this distinction between so-called positive and negative rights is a very artificial one, uh, and it becomes extremely ambiguous uh, the moment you try to actually talk about any rights in particular. So, for instance, negative rights are almost always construed as don't tread on me, right? Uh, but, you know, it almost all, don't tread on me almost always includes property. Uh, and, of course, property is an economic right, right? It's a right to something that someone else has to protect on your behalf. In this case, it's set, like a state. Uh, backed up by laws and backed up by various mm -hmm. institutions. Uh, so that all also organically flows from the right to help possess property, 
right? Or even think about something like a right to a fair trial, right? A very standard liberal right going all the way back, some would argue, to the Magna mm -hmm. Carta, right? You can't really have a fair trial unless you have a lawyer that's willing to represent you, especially when you're dealing with opponents who might be very, very well financed to be able to hire, hire the fanciest lawyers around, right? Uh, and the list just goes on and on and on uh, when it comes to these kinds of so-called positive and negative rights, uh, where the reality is if you want to provide any kind of negative rights, you're going to need to tax and spend and create and do an awful lot in order to give them any kind of meaning and substance. So there's really not as much of a distinction between that and giving someone a right to something like an education, uh, as these conservatives would like to suppose. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, um, well, yeah. So I think what, I think what Peter said is doing here is just like, just kind of asserting that only negative rights can, uh, can be real rights without, without much argument that, um, you know, I mean, like really the only, you know, I would say good argument in the sense that it's convincing, right? You know, but, but the only sort of um, fully coherent argument that I can think of that's not just like radically question begging, right? Like that they're, they're only negative rights because they're only negative rights is uh, to, to assert that we have such like sweeping negative rights that any sort of redistribution at all violates them. And so you can't have rights that require other rights to be violated or something like that. I can at least understand that mm -hmm. argument. But Peterson can't make that because because he's because he's like trying to strike this relatively moderate position and say you know Scandinavia is okay. I have mixed feelings maybe about the Canadian healthcare system. You know it's like well okay all that goes out the window if you make that argument. So all that he's kind of left with is just stamping that you know. But like he still doesn't want to admit that there are positive rights because you know that would like undermine his whole um, like. That would be that would be many bridges too far, right? Towards left wing economic ideas, if he, uh, for, from his perspective, if he if he admitted that, right? He's willing to sort of say, make allowances for like maybe for utilitarian reasons, we can you know we can provide certain social services or whatever. But you know, as you'll see, I mean, I watched some of this part before, like you know, he's going to be very uncomfortable with the idea that anybody has a right uh, to uh, to those services, but like. Other than, you know, like without actually just kind of arguing about it a la carte, right? Saying, okay, like, does it, you know, do you actually think, you know, what's your moral intuition tell you about this? Could you fit it in with like other principles that you might subscribe to, whatever? Like without doing that, you know, he he doesn't have an argument that there's no, that there can't be positive rights other than just, well, all real rights are negative rights, which is the issue in dispute. I'd also point out that um, it is really interesting that, um that he, when Kyle says, uh, I want a real meritocracy, and like we could only have a real meritocracy if everybody started at the same place, which, you know, I really disagree with the first part of that quite a bit. The second part is just obviously true, right? You know, that it's not much of a meritocracy if, if everybody isn't starting the same place. But, um, but the, you know, I, I think Kyle is absolutely wrong to endorse meritocracy, even as an ideal, you know, we could get into that, but like, uh, even if you were, but I find it really interesting that Dr. Peterson won't even go along with that, right? You know, that he's like, no, 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 no you don't want that, right? Because he immediately recognizes that's like, oh, now we're in redistribution, you know, like, Peterson is at least smart enough to recognize that you couldn't have every, you know, you couldn't have meaningful equality of opportunity, you couldn't have everybody start at the same place without some you know, profoundly uh, extreme redistribution of resources, which I have to say is maybe progress because he always used to make a big deal about this distinction, right? I remember he would always say like, well, you know, quality of opportunity is fine, noble even, but you know, the, the quality of outcome, right? You can't have that, you know, and I think he's recognized that you need to equalize outcomes quite a bit, right? To even have like the kind of meritocratic equality of opportunity that Kyle is talking about, but also like, meritocracy is a fucking horrible moral ideal. I mean, watch Gattaca. Yeah, no, absolutely. And not only that, I think it's an incoherent one when you think about all the moral arbitrariness in life. Uh, but rather than even getting into that, it's worth noting that his little metaphor is just bizarre where he sits there and he's like, no, we don't want to put people at the same position in the starting line. What we <laughs> want to do is remove all the barriers 
to them advancing. It's like, so wait a minute. <laughs> if they were a thousand yards back from where other people are starting, <laughs> do they, we still say that they lose the race and that it was a fair competition? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? It breaks down upon like the most rope kind of analysis, right? Yeah, you, but you'd, you'd think starting a thousand feet behind would be a barrier. Yeah, and I mean, that's a generous uh, metaphorical analogy when we're talking about something like people of color, right, uh, who are enslaved, denied basic civil rights, uh, denied access to jobs for a huge amount of time uh, in countries like the United States, right? A thousand yards is being way, way, way too generous uh, to the way a lot of people were treated in the United States. But look, you know, aside from all that, it's worth noting again, just to kind of harp on to this point one more time, because it's something that really bugs uh, yeah. me. Even if you if, if this is all too abstract, you can just look at the history of something like the 14th Amendment in the United States, right? Uh, one of the most important amendments, because huge numbers of rights have been abstracted and interpreted out of this idea that you need to provide people equal protections under the law, mm -hmm. rights to privacy, rights to, uh, you know, protections against police, rights to abortion, at least for a little while, you name it, right? Uh, and the reason is because they sat there and said, well... What does equal protection of the law mean? Sounds like a good negative right on the surface of it, uh, but actually there are an incredible number of things that flow from that, right? Again, equal protection of the law might mean that you need the state to pay for you to have a lawyer if you go to trial because if your life is threatened uh, and the prosecutor has limitless resources uh, to advance a case against you, maybe uh, that skews things a little bit in their advantage, right? Uh, and there's just endless examples of this kind of things in uh, just American jurisprudence, let alone world jurisprudence. So this very arbitrary ad hoc decision that no, there are no such thing as positive rights. The only rights that matter are the ones that I say matter, and they're all negative rights, uh, is ahistorical and very quickly becomes pretty incoherent the minute that you try to actually suss out what that could possibly mean. I mean, are you saying that the state shouldn't positively dispose itself towards protecting property rights? Yeah, right. I mean, uh, like, especially the way, the very simple way he put it earlier, which is that, well, you you don't usually have a right to have somebody do something for you. It's like, well, look, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess that's what you were saying, but I mean, like you, um, well, if nobody's enforcing them, right, the negative rights aren't worth much, right? You know, like that's, uh, so, so you, 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 those are, insofar as we're talking about like the kinds of rights that you think society should, uh, encode and protect you know legally right you know then those are absolutely rights to have somebody do something for you that like you know that if you have a right to life that means that you know you think that the agents at the state should stop people from killing you yeah and even Locke understood this right good old john Locke, uh where he pointed out look you know rights in the state of nature don't mean very much which is why we need to have a state uh and having a state doesn't really mean very much uh, unless we have a state where you're allowed to participate meaningfully in the affairs of your government, because otherwise it's going to become a tyranny and it's going to lord itself over you. And even rights to property are going to be unprotected. And there have been good lock-ins that have extrapolated rights to vote, rights to democracy, rights to political participation from this basic framework, right? Uh, is a right to vote a negative right? Some people would say so. I would say it really stretches the That's definition. Like yeah. Uh, to say it's something like that. Right. Uh, and this isn't some radical socialist making these kind of claims. This is John fucking Locke in the 17th century who understood uh, the logic of what he was arguing for better than most of the people who advance his banner thus far. Uh, yeah, no, you tell I, I taught I, a tutorial on Locke today. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, right. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Locke is a little, uh, you know, um, Locke is a little incomplete, you know, even on certain kinds oh, sure, of, yeah. uh, of of bourgeois liberal rights. You know, I I, I wish he'd I wish he'd been willing, been advanced enough to think that freedom of religion could apply to the Catholics. But uh, but uh, well, as a former Catholic, I could say that might be going a little too far. But you know, <laughs> we have to draw the line somewhere. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but yeah, no, I I think that's. But yeah, I think that's that's clearly you know. Yeah, I mean, I think Locke had probably thought about it a lot more, uh, a lot more than Jordan Peterson. I think at the uh, at the at the very least. But uh, I did watch this part earlier, and they do go on and talk about uh, positive and negative rights for a few more minutes. Let's watch that. Sounds good to me. They arguably have that right. I mean, mm -hmm. it depends. First of all, I don't like this French civil system. I think it's a catastrophe. Well, it's a Western catastrophe, so it's not that big a catastrophe, but. It's nothing, it, it has virtually no merit compared to the English common law system. And I don't think the French civil system would have been possible without the English common law system having been there first. And under English common law, you have all the rights there are. They're not granted to you by the government. 
They are an intrinsic part of your being and a necessary corrective to the overreach of the state. And those are only delimited by necessity when people engage in conflict. And then that conflict is adjudicated in the English common law system, precedent by precedent. And what would you call negotiation as to the borders of rights are undertaken at the level of extreme high detail. And that's a brilliant system. The French suffer from the same delusion. They've always suffered from this delusion, this French intellectual delusion that intellect and central planning can, can, can substitute for increment, the incremental movement of free market systems, including free market systems in the, in the area of jurisprudence. And that's just not the case. And the idea that you have a right to healthcare is like, well, who's gonna provide it? You're gonna force doctors to do that? And how are you gonna do that exactly? With force. And so, so Every I'm not saying that healthcare has... isn't desirable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's the right issue here. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about whether or not the government can and should intervene so that a healthcare minimum is provided to the populace at large. That's a different issue. The issue here is the issue of right. And rights are very, you don't want to multiply rights beyond necessity because every right that you multiply puts the onus of responsibility on everyone as well. They're not, they're not cost free. So I guess and the so English weren't so bright when they sat there and said, you just start off with every single rights you can possibly, every single right you can possibly imagine, every single one of them, because we don't want there to be too many rights. They need to be narrowly enumerated and narrowly conceived. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I knew this part was going to drive you nuts, uh, you know, because because you, you've you been much more steeped in, in legal theory, uh, at least at some points in the past than I ever have been. Um, and, and it, it struck me as very odd, but, but I, I think, um, so Peterson is doing a couple of, of things here. One, he doesn't quite spell it out enough for it to be clear if you don't spend too much time, like watching and reading and thinking about these people. Uh, but, um, but he's, he's making this like weird stretchy analogy between like the, the, the Hayek von Mises kind of calculation objection to socialist planning and um and then uh this like objection to really having like enumerated rights and constitutions um which is which is a weird i mean i don't know i mean maybe there are other people who make it but but it's it's a really weird analogy for any number of reasons but like the idea seems to be as far as I can tell, like I said, you know more about stuff than I do. You might be able to correct my reading here, but as far as I can tell, what Peterson is saying here is, well, um, you know, you don't the same way we don't want like, you know, gosh plan, right? You know, the Soviet planning office try, you know, doing like a five year plan. You know, we want the sort of spontaneity of the free market uh, that we shouldn't want like co constitution designers. Uh, say what rights we have we should want rights to sort of spontaneously and somehow organically emerge in the way that they do in like common law traditions maybe and um and which is also as he will make explicit in a minute is just as much an objection to uh to the american constitution as it is to uh to, to the french but like it also just seems kind of crazy on its face because like um okay you have all the rights you could want in English common law. It's like, well, I don't know. I mean, like, start and win, right? I mean, tell that to the Chartists, right? But like that also, um, what's, like, it just seems like as a matter of historical fact, we sort of know that rights don't work like that, right? I mean, like, um, you, know, the, you know, there aren't a lot of rights more fundamental than the right not to be enslaved, right? You know, and, and, and that didn't sort of, work its way up from some sort of organic common law process. I mean, that was, um, you know, that was brought out by a bit of, you know, state planning in the 1860s. Yeah, I'll bring this up very shortly. Just my fire alarm is ringing uh, at the moment. <laughs> Bill, somebody was trying to silence me. I'm being censored uh, by the censorious rights. So, um, all right, no problem. I'll, I'll, and, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's keep going and we'll, we'll, we'll pause when you're, uh, uh, <laughs> we'll pause when the fire is over to determine. I'm also not a fan of bills of rights. I think they're generally a mistake. Really? I like the English system much better. Yeah, so, absolutely. So like the bill of because rights the, in, the in America, problem with you don't like that? Not particularly, no. I think it's an wow. inelegant okay. solution. And the reason for mm. that is that 
under the English common law system from which the Bill of Rights was derived, you have all the rights there are. Whereas under a French civil system, which is, and, and that derivative of that is the American Bill of Rights, the government grants you the rights. And I don't believe the government grants you rights. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think rights are a secondary derivative of a social contract. That's a that's wrong way of does. looking at it because it, it makes the government and the social contract the source of the rights. And I think that's a big mistake. So, so you're not a fan of basically any positive rights. You think we have negative rights and that's basically the end of it, correct? Well, you'd have to tell me exactly what positive rights you're thinking about. I don't believe that you have a right to health care, even though obviously the more health care we can provide to people in the most efficient possible manner, the better that is for everyone. Now, health care is a tricky one because it's, a, it's an unlimited domain because almost everything can be shoehorned into the category of health. And so that's also a problem with regards to, let's say, delimiting what might constitute the right. I mean, you have a right to health care. You have a right to mental health. You have a right to physical health. Well, of course you don't. Obviously not. How could I? I just want to pause here to briefly say that is one hell of a thing to obviously not. You know, that you, I mean, like... Yeah, I mean, obviously, if a poor person, you know, needs to see a psychiatrist to get some medication so they don't have a breakdown and uh, and end up at a psychiatric hospital, you know, that's like, obviously, they don't have a right to that. I mean, what are you talking about? You know, that's socialist lunacy there. Could you possibly have a right to those things? No more than you have a right to food. It takes effort and time to produce food, and it takes effort and time for people to care for you. And so there's no there's no right to there's no right to that. Well, I guess when I'm talking about it, I'm just referring to it as a matter of funding. So do we mm -hmm. have private companies that are interested in profit being the ones who provide the care? Or do we have it as a matter of public funding? So instead of our tax dollars going to, I don't know, war, corporate bailouts, etc., our tax dollars would go towards funding people's health. Well, I can tell you what can Canadians do when they're in a, Can in a healthcare crisis, mm -hmm. if they have money. They go to mm -hmm. the states. It also so works the other way too, though. There are people know, who go know, to single-payer countries because they can't afford healthcare here, right? I know. Uh, yes, Hadrian. Uh, <laughs> hard agree on that. Uh, you do have a right to food. I mean, like, and I mean, I was thinking about this during part of this discussion, and people who watched the show on Monday had a little bit of back and forth about with with Jed about this, the philosophy segment at the end of the show because she has. Um, you know, like, like she has a, you know, I mean, she's certainly a good social Democrat and supports all of these, you know, all of these programs, but I mean, like she has a different view about how to think about justice, whether justice is even the most important thing, or we should be thinking about virtue and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you have certain rights, but like other values could override those rights or whatever. And so that was like a more, uh, sophisticated discussion, but like, um, but also, so I was thinking about this, it's like, okay, what's really at stake here? Right, and whether to call these things rights, right? Because because my instinct is that Kyle is uh, is missing a beat here, right? That that I think he's wrong to to sort of give up this territory as quickly as he is here, in a way, right? That he's saying, well, it's it's not. Um, he say, well, what I'm talking about is just funding. It's like, well, no, there are two issues here, and we should separate them out, right? One is like, is it a good idea, maybe for pragmatic reasons or whatever, to have. Um, uh, nationalized uh, healthcare, and the other one is like, is that a way of guaranteeing some people something they have a right to have, right? And say, so I was thinking about like, what's an issue with this? Because you know, you ask different thinkers, they'll define rights in different, very different ways sometimes. Uh, but like, it seems like at the very least, like part of what we're saying when we say that something's a right is that like you're committing like a a pretty bad injustice if you if you don't you know, if you don't respect it, right? That the, uh, and, you know, I mean, certainly just on a, just on a level of raw intuition, I mean, like if anything, you know, if there's anything that your society could do to you that would be unjust, it's just letting you starve to death when it has the resources to, to feed you. I mean, if, if, if anything counts as a rights violation, I mean, surely I would think, um, you know, that would be it. So yeah, I had the same reaction when Peter says, I was, oh, you, you know, well, it'd be absurd to say that you have a right to food. It's really, it seems pretty absurd to me to say that you don't have a right to food or, 
you know, again, mental or physical health care, you know, all of those, uh, all of those, all of those things. I mean, seem seem awfully unjust to me to uh, to deny to people if you have the resources to provide them. But uh, mass fire alarm is still fire alarm. Mass building is still going off. Uh, let's uh, let's plunge ahead a little further. Oh, that's why I said right. that it was people with money that did it. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I didn't say everyone could do it, and they can't. But but when push comes to shove. You want to think very hard about whether you want to be in a situation where you cannot, no matter what resources you have at your disposal, get timely treatment for your wife's cancer. That's true. But to your point before, uh, we do a wallet biopsy here. So you're rationing care by one metric or another. The question is, do you, do you ration it based on need or do you ration it based on wealth? No, you can't ration it based on need. You can't ration anything based on need. And that's another misapprehension on the Marxist side. Who the hell determines need? How in the world do you well, determine need? Somebody like, how do you out in the emergency what? room, I think they take precedence. That's though. a facile answer. Is it? I'm asking a serious question. I thought I was given a serious answer. No, you're not. Because there's when you're trying to parcel out need, mm. you're dealing with multiple serious existential catastrophes simultaneously. And we don't know how to adjudicate the provision of resources based on need. You know, so I can give an example of that. Imagine you have a kid who's a single parent, mother, minority, um, deprived family, unbelievably academically gifted and capable of benefiting from a high quality publicly funded education. Or you have a kid who's got a form of cancer that is likely to be painful and produce protracted suffering over a lengthy period of time. You've got a finite pool of money. How in the world do you adjudicate between those two situations? And the answer is you can't. And that's only two situations, not the million situations that actually exist. And the way we do adjudicate between those situations is we use money. That is the mechanism for adjudication. And you might say, well, it produces all sorts of unfair consequences. And the response to that is, yeah, that's for sure. But that's not the issue. The issue is, well, what makes you think you can do better? This is, uh, you know, I, I feel bad to <laughs> keep, uh, keep pausing when it's, uh, uh, only me that can be talking right now, but I, I don't want to let this part go by because um, this is really a jaw-droppingly awful argument, right? Because uh, what is he saying? Uh, Kyle's response was, "Well, look, here's a clear case of something we, you know, we could all agree is greater need that should take precedence um, over, you know, non-emergency medical situations." And Peterson says, oh, that's facile because there are other cases where it could be a much harder determination, you know, who has greater need, which, you know, true enough. But then the conclusion he's drawing from there are other cases in which it might be much harder to decide who has a greater need is therefore we should just let money determine it, which is a flying logical leap into like nihilism, right? I mean, that that is a that is a insane conclusion to draw from that premise, right? That like, yeah. There are very easy cases like Kyle's where it's very clear who, who needs resources more in the medical system. There are other cases where it could be a much harder evaluation who needs it more. Um, so therefore, because there are cases where it might be hard to determine, we should just throw it out and uh, we should just throw out any concern with need and just, just, let the, just let rich people cut to the head of the line because of their money. I mean, that's, that's a, I, I mean, that's, pretty astonishing that peterson thinks that thinks that's a real argument and that you know what kyle said is facile that's not i'd also like to point out how deeply insulting that is to the entire western tradition uh because philosophers going back to aristotle pointed out that there are ways of adjudicating these questions uh and in an aristotelian vein we can point out that when it comes to these moral issues especially in complex cases uh we can only answer them with the kind of accuracy that the subject can permits uh but that doesn't mean we can't get closer 
to a better answer than just sitting there and saying, well, let the chaos uh, of what people want to spend their money on decide how it is that society should spend its meek resources, right? Uh, if anything, the kind of one being facile here is him uh, because he thinks that when you are confronted with a handful of difficult cases, you just have to throw up your hands in the air and say, well, world's too complicated, so we just have to let the chips of life fall where they lie, right? Uh, and I would say that anybody who has any kind of balls uh, would say that we can do a little bit better than that. But I did just want to say something because it was uh, you're right. I was kind of chopping on the bit to say this, which is that I think that most of his interpretation of rights uh, is drawing on a paper he wrote in 2006, which was a really bad paper uh, where he talks about natural right uh, claims. That he's going to discuss, you know, the kind of Anglo tradition of rights, but really only discusses John Locke and no one else but John Locke and doesn't get John Locke uh, very right at all. Right. Uh, but one of the things that's important to note here is that when it comes to the English common law tradition, he doesn't seem to understand that figures from Blackstone through Burke to Roger Scruton, uh, who he had a conversation with, will all point out to him that English common law has never been oriented around this idea that everyone starts off with every single right by nature. In fact, far from it, right? There's this idea that what rights you get are determined by culture, history, and here's the byword, courts, right? They get to decide if you have these rights or you don't. Uh, and many critics, including many liberal critics like Locke, right, uh, condemned the common law tradition for exactly that reason, saying, no, why should we allow these elite institutions to be the ones who decide what rights we have and what rights we don't? Uh, we should instead interpret these rights as flowing from something like natural law in Locke's case or the principle of utility uh, in Bentham's case, right? Uh, and this is really, really irritating uh, because... Yeah. What you see here in these kind of circumstances is yet another kind of example of him raising or venerating a set of institutions that he apparently hasn't bothered to actually learn about with any kind of sophistication. Uh, he just seems to have heard about them in a half-assed way and decided just that it's appropriate to say half-assed things about them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is that is extremely interesting. I, I think... Um... Like this is Burkeanism 101, right? I mean, Burke's response yeah. to the American, sorry, to the French revolutionaries was all of you are saying actually that you have every right under the sun just given to you by nature. Uh, and in fact, you don't. And if you look at our good English common law system, we say that people get very circumscribed rights that are determined by history and in particular that are set by the powers that be, right? Uh, and that's the reason he thought that the English common law system was superior uh, to the French system. The, English, the American system is actually a tricky one uh, because it does enumerate a certain set of rights, locates them uh, within the broader continuum of English common law. But then also you have the Ninth Amendment, which says, even though we're enumerating all of these rights here, uh, nevertheless, that doesn't abridge any other rights that the people might have, which is an interesting one, right? Uh, that's never really talked about all that much. That, that so is kind really, of, a really interesting one because because it, it seems like, uh, I mean, that that you know, that seems like a hell of a cheat code if, you know, courts ever really decided to, you know, like... It is, yeah. ...lead on it. Well, some of us are calling them to do that, to enumerate something like a right to an abortion, right? Or to at right. least uh, create a right to an abortion out of the Ninth Amendment. It's probably not going to happen, but it could be done, maybe, if you had a really yeah. ambitious judge, right? You know, but the point here is that these different systems of rights are very, very interesting uh, and deserve careful study on their own merits and demerits. Because I'm not sitting there saying that the French system that you saw emerge with the French Revolution was great either. In fact, I'm sympathetic to certain Benthamite uh, objections to it, uh, right? Uh, but, you know, again, I just wish that conservatives would actually spend some time learning about the things that they claim to cherish so much uh, so they could actually talk about them with a little bit of honesty uh, and a little bit of historical accuracy instead of just writing these extremely bizarre hagiographies that the minute you look at them just break apart uh like taffy <laughs> yeah um yeah i i also i mean i don't know there's just something very funny about the thing about the idea that you can like the writers of constitutions can expand freedom as a french intellectual delusion but uh but yeah i also i mean but the point about burke is great because i mean like peterson sometimes presents himself as kind of uh ordered liberty you know, conservative, which yep. which is the the sort of tradition in which, um, you know, you'd think he'd be very sympathetic to that point. So yeah, this is this weird, um, 
this is this weird melange of things, but like also just that's because he wants to have it all every which way, right? Nights are rights are natural, but come from God, and you have all of them, which can sound very profound and very robust on the one hand. But of course, if you extrapolate from that, that rights are just given to you by God. Uh, God says a lot of things to a lot of people. Let's just put it that way, right? That means you can almost enumerate any right that you want, and he doesn't want that, so he's going to sit there and say, "Well, we need to leave it in the hands of." elite institutions like court to decide what God meant when he gave you all these rights. And it turns out he didn't intend to give you all that many, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I did just want to go back to the healthcare argument before we go on because, because it, it really is just like astonishingly bad um, that saying like, okay, if you are trying to determine it, health, like um, if you were trying to ration healthcare resources on the basis of need, you will sometimes get it wrong because like it's really complicated and hard in some cases to determine that again fair enough i'm with him so far right but therefore we shouldn't even try like really like that the you know that you'll sometimes get it wrong therefore you should throw that overboard in favor of just a, uh in, in terms of just like letting whoever has the most money by their way to the front of the line i mean like surely i would think you could say like yes human systems are fallible um you know like attempting to ration on the basis of the need there's no guarantee that you'll always you know you get it right 100 percent of the time but like if you're just rationing on the basis of money i mean what what percentage of the time do you think you'll get it right after that i mean what was really facile is what he says at the end of his presentation of that argument it's like oh you know will you get the you know Will that sometimes lead to things being really unfair? Well, you betcha. It's like, well, okay, but you just haven't, like, you just haven't completed your argument, right? You've told us this system is fallible, therefore let's use this one instead, where the therefore where the one you want to use instead is one that's not even aiming at that goal. I mean, like, and, and it's also just like, yeah, you mentioned philosophers going back to Aristotle, trying to think about how to, you know, determine greater need and all that. And fair enough, but I mean, like, also at a more mundane level. Yeah, I mean, let, let's be clear. It is a hard problem, right? And there sure. are tough cases. Totally, right? But there are also, like, you know, that's that's also why, like, hospitals have ethics boards, right? Like, that there's, there's a, uh, there aren't, um, it's not like countries that have taken healthcare out of the market entirely just have no systems for trying to adjudicate those things, right? They, they, they might not be perfect systems, but they do. I mean, they have a... Like, I would much rather, you know, have, um, I mean, I remember thinking this back when Obamacare was, was first being um, debated, and there was this minute there where, like, you know, Sarah Palin and people like that kept talking about death panels. And um, I, I remember thinking and telling people at the time, it's like, look, I mean, it's kind of funny because it's like, yeah, like healthcare, you are dealing with life and death, right? You know, you're deciding how to distribute potentially life-saving resources. Obviously, the more money, you know, the bigger um, the share of society's resources that's going to healthcare, the sort of further out those limits are going to be. And it's, and I'm, all, you know, very enthusiastically in favor of expanding them. But like, uh, but yeah, you are going to have to to make life and death decisions about who gets care. You know, given that you don't have infinite resources to go around. But it's like I would actually much rather those decisions be made by panels of subject matter experts right who might not always get it right right they're just like letting rich people bribe their way to you know to to you know to get in you know to get into the front of the line ahead of people with obviously greater need no absolutely and i think in some circumstances that would be appropriate right uh, i do think that doctors for instance should tend to make the calls uh when it comes to the allocation of things like medical resources um, but I think the general socialist intuition, and I say general socialist intuition because there are exceptional cases where I don't think this should be extended to, uh, like medical instances, right? right? Is that generally speaking, these questions are very complicated and they don't always permit of, uh, the right answer. And so what you want to have a society that's pretty thoroughly democratized so that you don't have nodes of power that allow certain people to make decisions about how you're going to allocate resources that will ultimately privilege their interests over the interests of everybody. Yeah. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that democratic decision making is always going to hit on the best answer. And that's one of the reasons why you need to have, for instance, a system of rights that protects people yeah. against certain bad majoritarian impulses. But democracy is more likely to get the right answer uh, than various forms of authoritarian rule. No, I, I, think I, that... I, think, I, I think that's right. I think broad policies about that should be set by democratic deliberation. I think I think particular applications, um, you know, I mean, I do think like, 
you know, I, yeah, I, I generally have that socialist impulse that you're talking about to sort of resist, you know, technocratic, you know, solutions to things, but like also legitimately, like, you know, I didn't go to med school. I, I, I think, um, totally. you know, I, 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 I'm prepared to defer to a certain extent to the like judgments of people who did about like which kinds of medical interventions are likely to, to pay off and all that sort of thing. Absolutely. And again, this is why I think that there are exceptions to this, right? And we need to be very careful in demarcating them. Uh, but I do have confidence that we can make these kinds of educations about where it is appropriate and where it's not, right? Uh, but one of the points that I want to make when it comes to economic issues uh, is the idea that you find in socialism that because how it is that we redistribute resources just at the kind of macrological level is so impactful on everyone. It's deeply unfair uh, to allow nodes of power to be concentrated so that some people get to make decisions about where tremendous amounts of resources go. Uh, everyone should be able to have a say uh, in making these kinds of judgment calls. And again, that doesn't mean that we're always going to make the right decision, but you're far more likely to get a better outcome uh, by allowing people to decide democratically how it is that the economy is going to be organized uh, than allowing Jeff Bezos uh, and a handful of other people get to dictate that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my cat wanted to cameo. Uh, <laughs> hey, Kitty. Uh, I am definitely with you on all that. Um, and, you know, I think the larger point here, I mean, just structurally, is like, okay, look, if you think about um, – anything ranging from like something like really technocratic where, you know, like the actual, you know, broad policies are being largely. Are you saying uh, you're not with her, Ben? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Right. So like, but like anything ranging from, from that, right. Like, like a really technocratic way of running the, the health system where like, there's really no, there are really very few nodes for, for like the larger popular will to like make its, its voice heard on that stuff anything through that through like some like really like really radically democratic state with a national healthcare system where uh there there are lots of ways right for public opinion to 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 shape you know what the broad policies are like there's a lot you could say about which to prefer and like where to and like where that spectrum you should want to be and all that stuff but like i think the larger point as far as as jordan's argument here is like Look, out of all the possible ways to ration care, given, you know, given um, ultimately scarce resources, which, you know, every system's resources are ultimately scarce, right? You know, they, uh, um, you know, they're not unlimited. So any, like, you would really have to try very hard to come up with a worse way to ration, you know, like, blood the resources and life-saving medical care than just, like, well, whoever has the most money wins. Like, I mean, like, I, I would be more comfortable with almost literally any system other than that. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to sit there and be Aristotle to sit there to point out that in the middle of a pandemic, when millions of people are going hungry, uh, maybe it's not the best idea for Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and a handful of other billionaires to be launching themselves into space to the tune of 30 billion a pop. Because, and I quote Jeff Bezos here, he just can't think of anything else to spend his money on, right? You can probably sit there and think, well, if you don't have any ideas about how that money should be spent, I certainly have a few about where it can be better allocated. You know, get Peter Singer in here, right? He'll give you a fucking index <laughs> up to your yeah, yin yang yeah. about what this money can go to, right? You know, and the idea that, you know, there's no way of actually starting at a very general level, making demarcations about the kind of things that we prioritize, and then moving down with higher levels of specialization to more specific and more penumbral problems is what's really farcical about this whole thing. Because that's what philosophers, and for that matter, statesmen, have been doing for hundreds of years. And that's what democracies have been doing for at least several decades now, and they've been doing it pretty successfully. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and again, like, the worst call that's going to be made because, like, you've instituted some, like, very terribly wrong-headed policies to, to guide the decisions of hospital boards or the hospital boards themselves are making bad, like... Like the worst policies would really have a hard time um, being worse <laughs> in their outcomes than just like, you know, uh, that than just like, you know, whoever comes for money, you know, gets to uh, gets to buy the way to the head of the line. Yeah. Um, if you happen to be lucky enough to inherit a fucking diamond mine from your apartheid dad, then, you know, you get to call the shots. Sorry. It's just, you know, the way that the lobster gods have ordained it. Yeah, exactly. Um 
uh Saberi six real estate uh San S. Uh thank you. Uh thank you for the super chat. Appreciate that. It says, why don't you guys do San Harris versus Jordan Peterson? Uh, you don't have to do another super chat, but can you clarify, uh, Sam, if you're talking about the recent, because I know they had a very recent conversation I haven't seen. I've also had several other conversations over the years, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's a little alien versus predator, but I'm I'm open to it. All right. Let's see if we can, we can get in like five more minutes here. And there is no evidence that you can do better. And so the idea that need should take precedence, like that's, that's fine in principle, although it's not. Who in the world could possibly adjudicate need? You know, and that's what they tried to do with the central planning committees in the Soviet Union when they were trying to make pricing decisions. And sometimes the Soviet central planners had to make like 5,000 pricing decisions a day. And they were trying to adjudicate need. Do we need more nails or do we need more hypodermic needles? Well, how in the world and that's like two decisions, not 5,000. How in the world are you possibly going to compute that? You know, Soviet planet really did have a lot of problems. He's not wrong about that. But um, they're in the world right now, right? There are any number of publicly owned healthcare systems that uh, that are actually quite successfully planned outside of the, the market, right? I mean... It's. I, I realize it's complicated, and there have been, you know, thatch rate reforms over the decades that have chipped away at it. But I mean, like, broadly speaking, right? I mean, the National Health Service in Britain is nationally planned, and it's so popular that even conservative politicians have to pretend that they want to preserve it, and they would never, you know, win another election. So to sort of be like, well, if we had, you know, if we tried to plan healthcare, then like, you know, then it would be just like the Soviet Union, like as if England didn't also exist. I uh, know Jeremy Bill G Gilbert wrote a really good book uh, on 21st century socialism, but one of the points that he makes that was just scathing uh, was that it's really telling that the most socialist institution in the United Kingdom is far and away the most popular one. You know? Yeah. And this is this is the other problem that the Marxists have in particular. The free market system is a giant Compute computational device, distributed computational device involving billions of calculations per second, trying to compute the transforming horizon of the future. And it can't be replaced by central planning, not even in principle. But don't you think there are some issues with that because profits at the core of it? So just to push back a little bit, a study came out, Scientific American reported on this recently. If the United States had a universal health care system, like Canada, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, 330,000 more lives could have been saved. So in some ways, I agree. Well, that the I, I listen to a study like that, efficient. and I think no one, no one in the world, no, there's no one in the world who can possibly produce a study like that with valid outcomes. You don't so, think that that's somewhat And the fact that empirical? Scientific American reported it, not in the least. I've done, really? 150, I've done 100 published studies. I know exactly mm. how they work. And there's no possible way that you can produce a It's an amazing claim just now. Conclusion. Not unless you build it in from the beginning. There's too many variables to take into account. I know, so especially when it's like, well, I don't have to read the damn thing. I just, I know. I've done 150 studies before. So, yeah, a priori, I've intuited this. Yeah, you've done some some small scale studies in psychology. Therefore, you know, you could, you could, you could pronounce the limits of human knowledge on this. Well, let's be clear also. This is a man, again, who points out in Maps of Meaning that he's talking about the existence of what makes up the world in a more than metaphysical sense, yet again, lecturing people, making a far narrower set of claims on why it is that they should show some epistemic community. So maybe he should take some of his own advice at various different points and actually read the article and then make an assessment on that basis. Yeah, no, exactly. Like he's just, yeah, just, just like the idea that he could just, I mean, this is the same thing as what you were telling me about earlier, the video to the Muslims where he's like, you know, I've thought about your problem and, you know, you should, the Sunnis and the Shiites, you know, they should write each other, you know, they should write each other some pen pal letters and, you know, they'll, they'll sort through this. You know, it's like, that it's like just this, just the, just the degree of arrogance on display here, you know, that it's like, you know, nope, I've got all this figured out, right? I know I've done some studies in a completely different field uh, of a completely different type. Therefore, I know in advance of having to even glance at the findings that this oh. this can't possibly be a legitimate study. Although, by the way, I like those freedom rankings. 
Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, he does this kind of thing quite a bit now. Uh, I mean, a couple of weeks before he got banned, uh, he tweeted out something nasty. I think it was also about Scientific American, uh, where a researcher published an article about how um, the way that our faces contort in certain circumstances aren't necessarily indicatory of our emotions, because there are a lot of factors for why it is, uh, that determine why it is that our faces contort in various different ways. Some of them are emotional, some of them are environmental, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and she claimed that Darwin was wrong on that basis. And he wrote about this just screaming, being like, this who knows who uh, in Scientific American just is saying now that Darwin is wrong. What a ridiculous claim. And it turns out that she's the world expert at uh, Northeastern <laughs> Europe University uh, who specializes in just this topic, right? How it is that faces respond to emotional and environmental stimuli. And even some of his fans were just like, maybe you should actually fucking read the article before you just decide it's bullshit because coming from the field of clinical psychology, I know what makes a good study and I know how it is that people's faces respond. And I know that this woman absolutely just has to be a nobody. Uh, they also pointed out that she's been cited vastly more than he has over the course of her career, as you might be uh, if you happen to be the world expert in a subject matter, right? Yeah, it's also just, I, I think it's pretty revealing that um, like Jordan Peterson has this kind of like great books for you of uh of intellectual history and of um you know and, and and just of i don't know science everything right you know that uh that like you know he reveres like big important books except for ones that were written by marx uh you know that were from a really long time ago and so like that's why he has he's doing this weird thing where he's like sort of a christian sometimes but he also loves nietzsche Right. You know, that like he because because it's like, no, that's like, you know, that's like fancy old great books. Right. That can't be bad. Right. You know, like uh, there must be some way of ultimately reconciling all this. Right. So it's like Darwin is in the fancy old great books list. Right. So it's like it, it doesn't matter. Like um, it doesn't matter what the evidence is. He doesn't need to look at it. You know, he just he just knows that it's wrong. I know. It's a very clear bit of favoritism here, right? And you see that all the time. Uh, I mean, you and I have pointed this out before, but it's very bizarre that Marx has to be continuously condemned for anticipating totalitarianism. Uh, but Heidegger and now Alexander fucking Dugan uh, get a hard <laughs> pass, right? Because they're real philosophers, even though they sit there and they actually actively participated in various totalitarian and authoritarian governments. So, Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, that actually be in the a member of the Nazi party and a rector of your university under the, under the Nazis. Yeah. Uh, and sitting there being like, by the way, my philosophy has a lot to do with Nazism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. might be a clue that you'd sit there and think to yourself like, wow, maybe I should interrogate this a little bit more closely. And that's not Sam Heidegger, by the way, because I think there are a lot of interesting things, sure. particularly in being in time. But like, no, if I, I heard I, somebody say that, I'd think like, maybe I'd take this with a little bit more caution. No, totally. Look, I mean, I, I, I had, um, you know, I had friends in grad school who who were doing like sort of very analytic philosophy ish philosophy of mind things, but they take a lot from Heidegger and yeah, and, and Herbert Drudis is a great example, right? Yeah, um, and so so I'm like, if somebody said, if somebody tells me, well, Heidegger was a Nazi, literally, but uh, I still think that you know, I still think he was brilliant, and like there are some insights that you can find there that I'm perfectly willing to accept that, right? But that I'm not the one saying that like you have to disregard Marx because um, dictators who were born after he died uh, claim to uh, claim to be inspired by him. You know, I mean, like that, that seems like a, um, that seems like a double standard for the ages, but I would respect your time. I know you said you had to, to get off at 10. So um, we're going to do a part two uh, next week. So uh, this is, um, and I think, I think we should be able to. I'd just like to do one quick shout out to, uh, Zane Lindback, um, talking about Michael Brooks there, uh, says misses the boy so much. Uh, we all do. So, you know, shout out to you and yeah, rest in peace, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just, um, yeah, I, I, I just kind of did a, uh, deeper dive than I'd like to and, and thinking about that. Cause, uh, cause I was, I was just, uh, yeah, I just finished writing something about him uh, recently. I've been putting it off for a long time. So, um, 
so yeah, that is uh, yeah, absolutely uh, yeah. And between now and, and next week, when we uh, we do part two next Thursday, uh, if you're if if you just can't stand going that long without Jordan Peterson uh, debunking uh, Reed Michael's book uh, against the web. Yeah uh is uh, very very good on this and uh we will um yeah i will uh i think uh charles wolford i believe is gonna be uh need to firm this up but i believe he's gonna be back on the main show on monday uh to uh to talk a little adorno just for something different uh so that sounds uh, fun yeah yeah i think so i think so I'm, i'm gonna um of course, uh, Charles has also written things uh, like scholarly musicology things about Led Zeppelin, so I might try to change the subject to that because I know a whole lot more about Zeppelin than I do about Adorno. But uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to keep most of it on Adorno. So I, I can't tell you that Adorno would have fucking hated Zeppelin. Uh, <laughs> no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the Beatles were a step. To, jazz was sometimes a fucking step too far. Zeppelin, he would have fucking shit himself and just been like, God, the apocalypse is coming. And maybe it's not such a bad thing. You know, he would have heard the first like couple of twangs of Stairway to Heaven and been like, oh, the sweet music to die to. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So, and then, yeah, we'll be back with, uh, with part two of, uh, of this breakdown next week. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Check out Matt's uh, links in the description uh, for. Uh, for this uh, this stream, and you should uh, you be watching or listening uh, to Matt at Plastic Pills and reading to him in uh, Jacobin and many other places. And uh, I will see all of you lovely people on Monday. Left is best. Peace.